Good morning, everybody. Is this too much? Seriously, is it? How many say I should wear this hat the whole time? How many say take the hat off? Thank you very much, sir. It looks better on you than me. Well, aloha, everybody. Good to be with you again. Hello, Jim. How are you? Uh, I'll tell you what. Uh, we had a crazy couple of weekends. Uh, of course, we had the Harvest Crusade. In Southern California at Angel Stadium, over 100,000 people came over three nights. Uh, over 10,000 people made a profession of faith to follow Christ. So that was amazing. But about uh, two months ago, we were given an invitation to go to a special dinner at the White House held for evangelicals. It was a beautifully handwritten invitation. Very impressive, I have to say, when you get uh, an invitation from the White House, heavy stock, you know, your name is written out in script. And so we finished the crusade, and then we uh, made our way back to Washington, D.C., and this was an event to really honor evangelical leaders. And I was privileged, privileged to be included in that group. I don't know how I got in that group, honestly, but there I was. Along with people like Dr. James Dobson and David Jeremiah and Jack Graham and Eric Metaxas. And, and the list goes on. So uh, it was like a state dinner. I've been to the White House before, but I've never seen anything on this scale. We walked in, we were greeted by a full-blown orchestra. Uh, Marine Corps Orchestra, incredible. And we were allowed to walk in and out of the rooms. And so I went into the Oval Office, started calling people up. No, I didn't, but we didn't have access to that room. But a lot of the rooms, so we're walking around taking pictures like the tourists we were. And uh, then we went into this dining room. There were over 100 of us seated at different tables. And five people were going to be allowed to get up and say something. The president was there, the first lady, the vice president, Mrs. Pence, uh, some members of the cabinet and so forth. And so five people were asked to say something and I was privileged to be one of the five. But And the president gets up and uh, he was sitting with Franklin Graham and Jensen Franklin, another preacher, and he goes, I talk to Franklin all the time. You know, you have all these speakers in this room. I want to hear from you. So it was like an open mic, which I thought was kind of risky, right? 110 crazed preachers in one room, open microphone, right? But it went incredibly well. And at the end, I was supposed to end, uh, finish it off with a few words and a prayer. So I'm making my way up to the podium, and I look, and the first lady is making her way to the podium. So I stop, and I gesture like, please. And she gestures, no, please. And I gesture, no, please. And very awkward, weird moment. I thought, why do I have to mess everything up, right? So I got up and uh, I thanked her for an event she spoke at a while ago for her husband, and she recited the Lord's Prayer just out of the clear blue sky. And a lot of people criticized her for it, and I wrote an op-ed complimenting her for it because I thought that was a great thing to do. And, and then I shared, there was a lot of compliments directed toward the president, and, and I, so I decided that I wanted to just sort of focus on a spiritual aspect of our country and I reminded everyone in the room. And it, I have to say, it, this is an intimidating audience to stand in front of. Not you guys, those guys, right? I mean, when the leader of the free world is sitting there and the vice president's over here and all these cabinet members, you just kinda, I can't even look at these people right now and think about what I'm saying. But I reminded everyone that our country uh, was built on spiritual soil. You know, the spiritual founding father of America was named George. Not George Washington, but George Whitfield. George Whitfield was an evangelist. He wasn't even an American. This is before we were officially a country. He preached to the colony, so by the time Whitfield was done, 80% of the colonists had heard him preach in person, including Benjamin Franklin. And many came to Christ. And so because of this revival that broke out, uh, and so many were believing in Jesus, there was a morality that came as a result of the revival. And those, that was the soil that the seeds of America were planted in, and that's why we have problems today, because we've lost that moral base, which, if you're really honest, is a biblical base. So I reminded everyone that we needed to pray for another spiritual awakening in America. And I quoted Second Chronicles 7, 14, which says, of course, as you know, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face 
and turn from their wicked ways. And God says, I'll hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. So I pointed out when God wants to send revival, he doesn't point at the White House. He points at his house, the house of God, God's people. And so then I prayed for the president. And, and let me say this, because some people get very angry. They say, you shouldn't go and pray for the president. Oh, sorry, last time I checked in the Bible, <laughs> I'm supposed to pray for whoever is in authority if I voted for him or not, okay? And if Hillary Clinton had been elected president, I would have been happy to have done the same for her. Or if Barack Obama had ever invited me, I would have been happy to have done the same for him. It's the first time I was invited to do such a thing. So I took the opportunity and did it. And, uh, but what I prayed for the president, yeah, that's right. Susie approves, very good. So, and I want your approval desperately, I really do. And Jared's as well. But especially I want the approval of Pooh Bear. That's, yeah. that's right, really want Pooh Bear. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> but what I prayed for the president was that, well, Philippians tells us, don't worry about anything, pray about everything. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind. In Christ Jesus, I thought, think of the stuff you're exposed to when you're the president of the United States. Think of the intel you look at, the genuine threats against our country, and uh, the pressure that comes on a person in that position. And uh, so I, I prayed for him that he would be able to cast his cares upon Jesus Christ and that God would give to him his peace. And you know what? None of us sit in the Oval Office. None of us are leaders of the free world. Many of us aren't even leaders of our own house. But, you know, we still have our pressures, don't we? We still have our problems. We still have our burdens. Some of you may have come here to church today with a real burden that you're bearing a lot of hardship, you're filled with anxiety, you're filled with worry, uh, you don't have any nails left to bite off, and you don't know how your particular situation is going to be resolved. Well, if that's how you're feeling today, and you've come to the right place at the right time, because we're going to talk about that in the message before us, and the title of it is, strangely enough, Time to Take Out the Trash. Amen. And I'll get to why I named it that in a few moments, but uh, we're going to look at two passages today. So I want you to turn there with me, if you would. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And also Matthew chapter 6. 1 Peter 5, Matthew 6. We'll get to those in a moment. But let's pray together. Now, Father, as we come after a time of worship to your word, we pray for clarity. We pray for perspective. We pray for wisdom. And we pray that you will speak to every heart in this room. So we commit this time of Bible study to you now. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you, but I don't like to take the trash out. I don't know why. It's really not that hard. And for some reason, it's sort of a universal truth of humanity that men take the trash out. Maybe it's because generally men are stronger than women. Not in the case of Jim and Tamara, but in general, <laughs> I just had, I, well, I, like I lifted her up and knocked you down all at once. I thought it was fun. Thank you very much. But that's not always the case that men are stronger than women, but there's just some unwritten law of the universe. Guys take out the trash, right? Now I have these really nice trash cans supplied to me by uh, my city that have wheels on them. It's not a big deal. I tilt them. I just roll them out. But I, I put it off. Oh, oh, time to take out the trash. I don't want to take out the trash. I hate to take out the trash. And I finally do it. And I leave it there for the trash man to pick up or the waste management professional. <laughs> uh, and by the way, they don't mind being called trash man. In fact, sometimes they do quite well financially. I know one guy that started his own waste management company, and he owns two or three Gulfstream jets that he charters out. So he's done pretty well in this business. But their job, and I'm glad there's someone to do this job, is to pick my trash up so I can fill my cans up the following week with more trash. It's good somebody wants to pick up our trash. Well, listen, let me say something that you might not understand at first, but let me explain. Among other things, 
Dare I say it, Jesus is a trash man. And what I mean by that, I'm not in any way uh, forgetting the fact that he's a creator of the universe, he's the savior, he's the Lord, he's our God. But I'm pointing out that Jesus literally wants to pick up the trash of our life, the burdens that we carry, and take them off of us, and take them to another place. And we should be thankful for that. Because Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all of you who are weary, you who carry heavy burdens, and I will refresh and relieve you with rest. You know, we all know what it's like to have those anxieties, those worries that weigh us down. And they often hit at the worst moments, like when you're trying to go to sleep, right? You just lay your head down on the pillow, all of a sudden, <laughs> sound effect there, of uh, just burdens. Oh, what about this? What about this? What about this? And, you know, what can you do? You're going to bed. And what I like to do is I just say, Lord, I'm giving all of these burdens to you now. You worry about them. I'm going to sleep. Now, of course, the Lord doesn't worry about them at all. But that's what the idea is. It's giving your cares, giving your concerns, giving your worries to the Lord. Sometimes those worries are imagined. Sometimes they're real. But whatever they are, if they're troubling you, you turn them over to God. And here's what the Bible says. Here's our first passage, 1 Peter 5, verses 6 to 8. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, So humble yourself under the mighty power of God, and at the right time he will lift you up in honor. Underline this part. Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Casting all of your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Stay alert. Watch out. Your great enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him. Be strong in the faith. Remember that your family of believers are all over the world and they're going through the same kind of suffering you are. So if you're taking notes, here's point number one. You're not alone in your suffering. Point number one, you're not alone in your suffering. Look at verse 8. Remember, your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. You know, somehow it's helpful to know I'm not the only one going through hard times. That's where family comes in. Ohana, the church, our community. The Bible tells us we're to bear one another's burdens. It's a really bad idea to isolate yourself and try to deal with these things all by yourself. You're designed by God, to share this with other people. Now, I might say that this may be easier for girls than guys. Girls are far more, in general, communicative. Guys, not so much so. Uh, like, for instance, my wife will say, I'm going on a walk with some of my girlfriends, and she's gone for like three hours. That was a long walk. Yeah, well, we like to talk. Why don't you just call it, I'm going on a talk, <laughs> instead of a walk? But that's a good thing, though, because they share their hearts with one another. They bear one another's burdens. They gossip. No, they don't ever do that. But, you know, <laughs> but the idea is they spend time together. And sometimes, guys, we sort of hold stuff in. And the reason we don't want to admit that we have a problem is because of pride. Because we want to come off like, oh, I don't have the problem. I can handle anything. I'm strong. I'm tough. I'm smart. Or I'm so spiritual. I don't need anybody's help. But that's interesting because that's why it says in verse 6, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Humble yourself. You do need help. I need help. We need help. We need each other. You know, when the Lord called our son Christopher home to heaven unexpectedly 10 years ago, it was devastating. And I honestly didn't know how I was even going to survive such a thing. Though I've counseled many people over the years who've lost children and lost loved ones, I thought, well, I, you know, first of all, I thought this would never happen to me. And secondly, I honestly thought if it happened to me, I don't know if I could handle it. Well, listen, God gives you the strength to handle what you need to handle when it comes. Not before and never after. And he gave me the strength, but it wasn't easy. And it isn't easy. But uh, the first thing I did was I reached out to others. Being a pastor, I know a lot of other pastors so I called them up, just said, help, help me. Tell me what the Bible says. Remind me. Well, Greg, you've been preaching the Bible for years, don't you know? Sure I know, but I needed someone else to remind me of it again. And boy, it helped me a great deal. Our son died on Thursday in an automobile accident, and we decided to go to church the following Sunday. 
people were shocked to see Kathy and I there. Like, I can't believe they're in church. Well, where else would I be? Sitting at home, staring at a wall? I wanted to be with God's people. I wanted to worship the Lord, and I wanted to hear God's word. People said, oh, you're so strong. You were a great example. I wasn't in church because I was strong. I was in church because I was weak, and I needed God. And there's no embarrass. I'm not embarrassed to say that. And anyone that doesn't understand that about themselves, you're just a punk, and you need to wake up. <laughs> I'm talking to guys now. <laughs> so humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may lift you up in due time. So number one, you're not alone in your suffering. Let God's family share it with you. Talk to other people. It's helpful to talk to somebody else who has suffered. Yeah. One of the things I did was I sought out people who had lost children because it's a very unique kind of a thing. And uh, just hearing from them really helped me. But uh, let's say you find out you have cancer. You might want to seek out someone who's a cancer survivor. How do they deal with it? You might want to talk to someone who's lost a spouse. If you've lost a spouse, so you can connect to them. There's a great resource there that we can offer one another. Number two, we need to give our burdens to God. We need to give our burdens to God. Verse seven, cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you or Give all your worries to God, for he cares for you. The word cast is not the normal word that we use for throwing something. It is a word that signifies a definite act of the will by which we stop worrying about something and let God assume the responsibility for our warfare. It's a very uh, deliberate action. I'm gonna take this thing that I'm worrying about. I'm gonna take this anxiety. I'm gonna take this concern and I'm gonna deliberately give it over to God and I'm going to specifically stop worrying about it and leave it in his hands. That's what it means to cast all your care upon him because he care for, cares for you. And the word care uh, really implies that God is mindful of your interests. You know, if it troubles you, it troubles God. I have five grandchildren, I've told you that before. And most of them, all of them came over actually this uh, summer, a little bit earlier, in shifts, you know. And it was great being with them. But one of my granddaughters is named Alexandra. We call her Allie. And so the kids back in California are getting back in school again. And so she went and found out who her new teacher was. And she wasn't happy about it at all. <laughs> she didn't want this teacher. And plus a couple of her friends from last year weren't gonna be in the class she was in, so she was very upset, and so her mother told Kathy, and Kathy told me, so Papa, that's what my grandkids called me, is FaceTiming Allie. This is an urgent thing to me right now. I need to talk to her and encourage her. Now, I have a lot of things I can be involved in, but when something troubles one of my grandchildren, it troubles me. Right. And it, it may be a big thing to them, and it's, in a way, a big thing to me. So I'm just using that to illustrate the fact that if it troubles you, it troubles God. So if you're a little kid and you're struggling with something, you bring your burden to God. If you're an adult, it's the same. If who, Whoever you are, wherever you are, if it's a concern to you, it's a concern for him. Cast all your care upon him. Why should you do it? Because he cares about you. Very important. So what do you do when your trash can is overflowing? You take out the trash. What do you do when worries and anxieties pile up? You cast them on God. And here's something you must avoid doing at all costs, worrying. So now let's shift to our other passage. It's Matthew chapter six. This is uh, Jesus speaking from the Sermon on the Mount. We're gonna read quite a few verses. We're gonna read 25 to 34. By the way, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Here's what Jesus says. That is why I tell you, don't worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food? Isn't your body more than clothing? Well, look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or stew food in barns, but your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you more valuable to him than they are? So can all of your worries even add a single moment to your life? And why do you worry about clothing? Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all of his glory was not, as, not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? 
Don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of non-believers. But your heavenly Father knows all of your needs. Now here's the antidote. Verse 33, a familiar passage. Seek the kingdom of God above everything else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need and don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Powerful words, aren't they? Really, what? I should just stop now. But I'm a preacher and I won't. Uh, so point number one, we're not alone in our suffering. Point number two, we're to cast our cares on God. Point number three, the believer should not worry. The believer should not worry. Jesus was not saying a Christian should not think about or be concerned with the needs of life, like what you're gonna wear or what you're gonna eat or where you're gonna live. You should be concerned with those things. What he is saying, though, is don't worry about it. Plan for it, work hard, think about it, but don't worry about those things. Verse 25 can be translated, don't have anxiety about the issues of life. Don't have anxiety. Let me say something that might surprise you. Worry can actually be a sin. And if worry is a sin, then I am guilty of that sin. How many of you are guilty of it as well? Is there anyone here that never worries? Because I think you're a liar if you raise your hand. No, I don't, I believe you. I think you're delusional. No, I don't think it. I actually admire you if that's true. But uh, you know, it's an interesting thing, the word worry. It comes from an old English word that means to strangle or to choke. And that's what worry does. It, it strangles you in so many ways. It strangles you emotionally. It strangles you spiritually. Uh, coming back to my grandkids for a moment, the, the other day they were choking me. They thought that was a really fun thing to do. They'd come up from behind, grab me by the neck. And as they're getting older, their choking is, is hurting more. And I was starting to black out momentarily. So they came over another day and said, Papa, we want to choke you again. I said, no, no more choking, Papa. This is becoming a problem. And that's what worry does. Right? It chokes us. It's, it's a thing that can hurt you in so many ways. It's been said, worry is a lot like a rocking chair, always moving but never getting anywhere. The problem with worry is it's interest paid on trouble before it's due. And it doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. There's no productive thing about worry whatsoever. So you might do what one guy did. He hired someone to worry for him. He, had, he was a real worry wart, and he just couldn't overcome it, so he took an ad out in the paper, wanted someone to worry for me. And he found a guy, and so he was telling a friend about it. Yeah, I don't worry anymore. I have a guy that does my worrying for me. And the friend said, wow, how much do you pay a guy like that? He says, $25,000 a week. Wow, you don't make that kind of money. How are you going to be able to pay this guy? He said, that's for him to worry about. So, <laughs> that's one way to deal with it. That probably won't work out so well. <laughs> so better yet, cast it on the Lord and don't worry about it. We worry about so many things. You know, when things are good, we worry about how long will these be good? When is it going to get bad? Because I just know it's going to get bad. You worry about something that's not even happening. And then when things are bad, you wonder, will things ever get good again? You see, it's just a sort of vicious cycle. You go around and around. You worry all the time about what people think of you. You have your account on Instagram. You always look good. You've got your trout pout down. Do you know what I mean by the trout pout? It's where you hold the camera about here and you do this. Can you go for a close-up? Can you come in close? Okay, wait. here's the trout pout. Stop doing that. <laughs> girls, I'm talking to you. Okay? I've kind of slammed the guys. I'm talking to girls now. Guys don't do the trout pout. Jim does, yes, but not... <laughs> it works for him, he says. I think you think it makes me look thinner. It looks like a fish. Stop doing it now. But, we, you know, we have our image, our carefully crafted image. 
Here I am in my happy life. Here I am on the beach. Here I am with my cute kids. Here I am just living the perfect life. Well, that's nice, but we don't show. Here are the dishes in my sink, and here's the trash cans my idiot husband won't take out overflowing with trash, and, and here's reality. No, but we like to show a perfect life, and we can be this way in general, and we want to put out a certain image, but the Bible is actually telling us don't be obsessed with these things. Instead, put God's word first and don't let yourself be filled with worry. And, you know, there are so many things that can bother us. And I think we need to come back to some good theology. The thing that has helped me get through the worst moment of my life in the past and the thing that helps me get through the hardest moments of my life in the present is reminding myself of what the Bible says. And one of those things is reminding myself of the simple fact that God is sovereign. What does that mean? I have no idea, but I like the way it sounds. <laughs> Jim, what does it mean? No, I don't. When we say God is sovereign, we're effectively saying that we believe that God is in control of our lives. It's also called providence, the providence of God. That there are no accidents in the life of the Christian. That God is overseeing everything that happens. And when you realize that, whatever it comes your way, you know that it is, as my friend Randy Alcorn would say, father filtered. Either God did it or God allowed it. And I don't know why God allows certain things to come into the lives of certain believers. I don't know why. But I know he allows it. And I know he's in control. And I know he loves me. And I know that he causes all things to work together for good to those that love him and are the called according to his purpose. So I find by reminding myself of God's truth, it helps me to get perspective. It helps me get my head above water for a moment. How many of you like to go out and surf? Raise your hand up. Okay, if you've ever fallen off your board or your flotation device or whatever you take out there and you've been caught in the white water and you get turned upside down. You can get disoriented and, and you're just trying to get a gulp of air before the next wave comes if you're out in a monster set or something like that. And if you have a flotation device like a surfboard, a boogie board, a stand-up board, whatever, and a leash, you can know this one thing. If you go down, if you grab your leash, it'll always pull you in the right direction because more than one person is drowned because they went down instead of up because they lost, they, they were disoriented. But that leash will go to your flotation device that always goes to the surface. And so the leash is like the word of God. I pull on the leash and I get a gulp of air and I get above water and I see I'm okay. And so we need God's word reminding ourselves that he is sovereign and he is in control. And here's some illustrations. I, and remember, Jesus spent a lot of times outdoors. And he would take his disciples with him and he would point at things and use those things to illustrate. So here they're just outside. It's a Sermon on the Mount. He goes, we're in Galilee. I've been to Galilee. And so you're just beautiful. We see of Galilee out there in the distance, not unlike the ocean I'm looking at right now. Sometimes I wonder, why don't we turn this around so you guys can see the ocean, right? What a view the preacher has, the worship leaders. In fact, I'm just gonna look at it and forget about you for a while. <laughs> no, okay, so... He says, hey, look at the birds. Because some birds are flying by. Look at the birds. And I think this was funny. I think they would have laughed when he said it. He says, you know, look at the birds. That birds don't worry because your father takes care of them. I mean, have you ever seen a bird worrying? Have you ever seen a bird pop a Valium or something like that? No. I have a bird feeder in front of my kitchen that I always replenish with seed. And uh, so I watch the little birds come in and they get their seed and they take off. So birds don't worry. They just chirp away, have a great time, eat their seed, and, uh, and that's the way they are. But they do get their seed. I mean, they don't just sit around and wait for someone to bring the seed to them. But they don't worry about it. That's the whole point Jesus was making. So look at the birds. They don't worry. And your father takes care of them. Now seagulls, you, we don't really have seagulls here, do we? That's a good thing. I hate seagulls. I hate them even more than cats, Ricky. I really do. I don't hate cats that much. I just find them worthless. But seagulls, seagulls I hate. Because seagulls, they're thieves. They steal stuff. They wait for you to go in the water. 
and they fly off with things. They see your food, they'll fly off with it. Sometimes they fly off with your children. Doesn't, you know, they're horrible birds, really, scavengers. But they get out there and they get things done, but they don't worry, that's for sure. Jesus, look at the birds. They don't worry. Reminds me of a little poem I read years ago. I kind of like it. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, Friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. You know, I know it's cute, huh? <laughs> birds don't worry. Why should we? Now Jesus says, Look at the flowers, verse 28. Don't worry about clothing. Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon and all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And by the way, when we read the word lilies, uh, we think of a lily, like an Easter lily, but that's not the kind of flower Jesus was referring to. It would have been a wildflower. And when you go to Galilee today, you'll see these beautiful wildflowers filling a whole side of a mountain or a hill with just resplendent color. Well, look at these wildflowers. Look at how beautiful they are. And even Solomon in his royal robe sitting on his golden throne was not as beautiful as these flowers. And so the point Jesus is making is don't be obsessed with your appearance. And some people are. I read recently that $16 billion are spent in America on cosmetic surgery every year, $16 billion, and that's Newport Beach alone. <laughs> now, I'm not against cosmetic surgery. I know many of you have had it. Stand up if you have. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Whatever. Doesn't always work out the way maybe you hoped, but, it, you know, whatever you want to do. You know, do the best you can do with what you have, right? But if that's your primary focus in life and all you think about is what you're wearing and all you think about is how you look and all you think about is your outward appearance and you neglect the spiritual, you're missing the point. Right. Now some people think only about the outward and they never think about the inward. That's a mistake. Some people are so focused on the spiritual life they neglect their appearance and maybe, honestly, they should think about it a little bit more, okay? So we're trying to find balance and all of these things. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying. Look at verse 27. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Look, you may go down to the health food store. And by the way, is it just me or is it, have you ever noticed strange people hang out in health food stores? <laughs> now, they, they're, they're interesting people. They often drive Priuses. I have nothing against Priuses. But back in California, they're always in the fast lane and they're always going under the speed limit dramatically. <laughs> Just saying. And sometimes I've even seen Priuses made out of kale. <laughs> Where did kale come from? I mean, I know it's been around, but all of us in kale's everywhere. I think we used to call that garnish, right? Like, oh, here's a little green thing you actually don't eat, but it makes your plate look pretty. Now everything's kale. Kale, kale, kale. So you eat your kale and you eat your tofu and you you know, do all the right things. You have the low-fat diet. Then, of course, a new study comes out. I just read this. I'm not making it up. New study comes out. Best form of diet is red meat and cheese. I'm serious. <laughs> so there you are with your kale, like, dope. <laughs> and now coffee's bad. No, coffee's good. No coffee. And it goes back and forth, right? And all these things. And there's all these confusing studies that are done. You're trying to extend your life. Listen to this, coming back to the sovereignty of God. You want to be practical. You want to be healthy. You need exercise. Your spirit lives inside of a human body that God has given to you because your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. But understand this. Your days are determined by God. And all the kale, tofu, <laughs> and anything else you think will extend your life will technically not extend your life one day beyond what God has ordained for you. In fact, I was watching the news a while back and they always say these stories to the end about some guy that lived past 100 and he's going to reveal a secret. So I waited through all the commercials, all the news. Finally, at the very end, some old codger, they have a camera following him into the market. Here's a secret. He eats a hot dog every day. <laughs> and it wasn't even like Hebrew National. It was one of those cheap hot dogs, probably made out of rat tails. I don't know, but... 
But I mean, it's like a hot dog every day, seriously, and you live past 100? And then you hear some guy who is a health nut who drops dead on a tennis court of a heart attack, right? Here's the thing. Don't worry about that stuff. Leave it all in the hands of God. Here's another point. Worry is an indication of a lack of faith. Worry is an indication of a lack of faith. Look at verse 30. If God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and are thrown into the fire tomorrow, he'll certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? He doesn't say you have no faith, you have little faith. Some people are more prone to anxiety and worry than others. They're mastered by their circumstances instead of mastering them. Our faith needs to grow. Remember the story of when Peter walked on water? A lot of people, you know, criticized Peter for that, but to the point nobody else walked on water besides Jesus, so that's pretty epic. But they're out on the Sea of Galilee, and there's a big storm, and here comes Jesus walking on the water. And Peter sees him and says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. I think Jesus probably smiled, oh, Peter. He says, come on. He did say come. So Peter swung one leg over the side of that boat. Then he pulled the other one over, put his full weight in the water, and he was standing. He took one step. Then he took another. And he's looking at Jesus. And then, of course, he began to sink. And he said, Lord, save me. Then he was underwater. Lord, you know, so. And Jesus pulled him up, and they walked back to the boat. But here's the point I wanted to make. Jesus said, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And it's a funny phrase in the Greek because it's actually one word. Oh, not you of little faith, but rather, oh, little faith. Yeah. Almost like a nickname. Yeah. Oh, little faith. <laughs> hey, man, you were doing so well. Why did you doubt? So this is what Jesus is saying here. Why do you have such small faith? You say, well, I want stronger faith. How do I build my faith up? Well, you made the right decision coming to church. Right. Because every time you open up the Word of God, you potentially strengthen your faith. Because the Bible tells us in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. So when I read the Word of God, it builds my faith. But more than just read it, I need to believe it, and then I need to obey it. Jesus said, you believe in God, believe also in me, or literally keep on believing. It's very important for us to believe our beliefs and doubt our doubts. And every time we gather together with God's people and study the word, we build our faith up. And another way to build your faith up is use it. Faith is like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it becomes. The more you neglect it, the more it will atrophy. And you'll grow weaker. So you need to use your muscles and you need to use your faith. Don't just talk about faith. Use your faith. Take steps of faith. Take risks. Take chances. That's the idea. I'd rather try and fail than never try at all. And a lot of times when we take a bold step of faith, the Lord will honor it and amazing things will happen. So don't be lacking in faith. And here's the last principle and we'll be done. Instead of worry, Put God and his word first in your life. Instead of worrying, put God and his word first in your life. Verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Basically, Jesus is saying rather than seeking and worrying about food and drink and clothing like non-believers do, focus your attention and hopes on the things of the Lord and he will take care of all of your needs. What does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? It means put God first in everything. Listen, put God first in your marriage. I hear of marriages falling apart. Oh, we have irreconcilable differences. From the original Greek, let me say to you, shut up. <laughs> Give me a break. Irreconcilable differences. Every married couple has irreconcilable differences. Kathy and I are getting ready to celebrate 45 years of marriage. So thank God for that. And we've had 45 years of irreconcilable differences. Greg, she says to me yesterday, you leave everything open. The cupboard doors are open. The drawers are open. What would my house look like if I wasn't here to close all those things for you? Now I won't say what I say back. I just wait. Sorry, I love you. 
But the point is, is that we always are going to have differences. Put God first. And putting God first in your marriage starts with striking the word divorce from your vocabulary. Say, whatever the problem is, we're going to resolve it as I seek to do what God has called me to do. Stop blaming her. Stop blaming him. Do what God's told you to do. Love your wife as Christ loves the church. Ephesians 5, husbands. Uh, respect your husband. Uh, also Ephesians 5, ladies. So put God first in your marriage. Or wait, put God first in your singleness. How many of you are not married? Raise your hand up. Hold up, keep them up. Look around. Connect the dots. Connect the dots. <laughs> Best place to meet that person is in church. I met Kathy in church. In fact, I was preaching and I noticed her. Don't get the wrong idea. I wasn't like scoping girls while I was preaching. <laughs> but she had some kind of light coming from heaven on her. I don't know what it was. Hard to not notice. But I found out later her sister was holding a flashlight over her, her head. There she is. No, seriously though. I met her in church. It's a great place to meet your future spouse. But put God first. Well, how do, how do you put God first in singleness? Start by doing what the Bible says. Start this way. Don't get romantically involved with non-believers. Well, I call it missionary dating. <laughs> call it what you want. I call it trouble. <clears throat> and I've seen one, more than one believer who is single end up in trouble getting entwined and entangled with a non-believer. Pray that God would bring that right person to you. Put God first in your business. You know, operate your business on biblical principles. You know, sometimes Christian business people want to advertise the fact that they're Christians, and that's fine. Just stink and deliver the goods, okay? I can illustrate this, unfortunately, in a negative way of people that talk the most about their faith are often not the most dependable. Services. And then sometimes I'll meet people that are believers and don't put it on their business card, but they do good work. You know, if you're in construction and you're a Christian, do your work well, have integrity, be honest, and that's a powerful testimony, and it earns you the right to share your faith. And so put God first in your business. Put God first in your personal finances. Say, well, how do I do that? Ready for it? Tithe. Yes, tithe. Every Christian should tithe. Well, what is a tithe? It means tenth. How much should I give? Start with a tenth. It's not rocket science. I didn't say end with a tenth. I didn't say pray about a tenth. I said start with that, recognizing everything that I have comes from God. I'm gonna give this percentage of my income faithfully for the work of the kingdom of God. And Kathy quoted that scripture earlier from Malachi. It's the only time where God says, test me on this one. Put me to the test on this. Bring all of your tithes into the storehouse and test me, storehouse, and test me, says the Lord, if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you will not have room enough to receive. Well, I can't afford to tithe. I can't afford not to. See, because I believe whatever I have, it came to me from God, so I'll give a percentage back to him. And then we bring offerings on top of that. And, you know, I believe if we will apply those principles in our life, God will provide for your needs. This is what it means to seek first the kingdom of God. It means to put God first. It means to seek God's kingdom above Greg's kingdom. God's kingdom above your kingdom. As my friend who's been with the Lord many years now, a great British preacher, Alan Redpath, used to say, you cannot pray thy kingdom come until you first pray my kingdom go. And I think that's very true. Will you let God's kingdom rule in your life over your kingdom where you want his will above your own will, and when you do, he'll take care of you. Verse 33, all these things shall be added to you. What things? What you're gonna wear, what you're gonna drink, where you're gonna work, God's gonna take care of it. So put him first in all things. Don't worry about these things, but trust the Lord in these things, and they will all be added to you. Now let me close by saying, all these promises <clears throat> are for believers. They're not for non-believers. If you're a non-believer and you come here today and say, I'm worried, well, you probably ought to be. <laughs> There's a lot of things to worry about. The thing you should be worried most about is where you'll spend the afterlife. But if you're a believer, I say to you today, don't worry. God's in control. If you're not a believer, 
I'd say, yeah, you should worry. In fact, you should panic. And you should come to Christ. Because he's saying, I want to take out your trash. I want to take your burdens. I want to relieve you of the pressure that you're under right now. So come to me, all of you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. I was down to Poco the other day, I'm watching everybody out there doing stand-up. I'd already caught my token three waves. <laughs> I was done. Jim was still counting. Jim counts all of his waves and tells us how many he caught. So I caught three. <clears throat> and I'm sitting there on the bench, and so they're trimming the trees at Poco, right? You know what I mean when I say Poco? Lani of Poco. I'm not talking about the Poco you eat, just in case you didn't know. So Pokey, that's right. It's not Poco at all, is it? So, you're kidding me back now, aren't you? You know, Jim, I deserve it. I've been a bad preacher today, and I'm sorry. Jim Felsner is a wonderful human being, folks, and I love him. The more I mock, the more I love, unless it's my wife, because I want to live to see tomorrow. But um, anyway, so I'm down at Poco. And there's this guy who's directing a bunch of young guys to trim the trees. These guys are climbing up these crazy palm trees. And one guy jumped from one tree to another, right? It's amazing. So, and I'm kind of staying clear because coconuts are falling. And, and this guy's really doing a great job. And uh, so he, a couple of the guys weren't working very hard. He was kind of getting on their case. Get in there and get to work. So I'm sitting on the bench. He's right near me. I said, you know what? You're a, you're a, good, you're a good leader. You're doing a good job here. Oh, thank you. And I said, you know... Did you ever wonder who the first gardener was? And he says, no, who? I said, well, it was Adam in the Garden of Eden. So I want to talk to this guy about the Lord. So he says, really? I said, yeah, I tell him the whole story of the Garden of Eden. He says, tell me more. So I tell him the entire, my entire testimony. And, I, and like he's listening, listening. I think, wow, this guy's really open. He goes, oh, I'm a Christian too. I'm like, you could have told me. He was putting me to the test. Turns out this guy's from Tonga. And he's over here working, making a little money to go back and continue his missionary work in Tonga. So I got his contact info because I want to help him out. But I thought that was great. But one of the things I told him, I remember I said, when I became a Christian, I was only 17 years old. But I remember when I prayed to ask Christ in my life, I felt as though a weight were lifted off me. And I mean, what kind of a weight does a 17-year-old have? Well, I had one. I didn't know it because I got used to it. I always carried it every day. Wait, there's a... And you know what that way was? It was my sin and it was my guilt. And when Jesus came into my life, it was taken away. I, did, I had not read the Bible at this point. I didn't read where Jesus says, I'll take your burdens from you. All I know is I felt almost physically a weight lifted from me. Some of you have felt the same thing, right? And this is what God will do for you today. Whatever your problems are. And here's your biggest problem, your sin. We've all sinned. There are no exceptions. We've all broken God's commandments. But God loved us so much he sent his son Jesus to die in our place and pay the price for our sins and rise again from the dead. And now Jesus Christ stands at the door of our life and he knocks and says if we'll hear his voice and open the door, he'll come in. So have you asked him to come into your life yet? Are you still trying to work this all out on your own? And here's God saying, I'll take your trash out. I'll take on your burdens. I'll forgive you of your sins. I'll help you. I'll change you. And best of all, I'll meet you in heaven one day. But you must put me first. If you've not done that yet, do it now. Jesus stands at the door of your life and he knocks and he says, if you'll hear his voice and open the door, he will come in. He's just a prayer away. So we're gonna close now in prayer and I'm going to extend an invitation for anyone here who has never asked Jesus to come into their life. If you've not done that, why don't you do it today? You will not regret it. Let's all pray. Everyone bow their heads with me if you would. Let's all pray. Father, thank you for your word to us. Thank you for loving us so much. You sent Jesus to die in our place. And now I pray for anyone here who does not yet know you. Lord, that you would help them to see their need for you. Help them to come to you. Help them to find the forgiveness you offer and help them to give all of their burdens and their problems and anxieties to you today. So we commit each one to you now. Now while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying, how many of you would say today, Greg, I need to give my burdens over to God. I need Jesus in my life. 
I need my sin forgiven. I want to start this relationship with God you've been talking about. Pray for me. I want Jesus to come into my life and I want to go to heaven when I die. If that's your desire, wherever you are, if you want Jesus to forgive you, if you want him to come into your life, if you want him to forgive you of your sin, would you raise your hand up right now and I'll pray for you. Just raise your hand up higher where I can see it. You want Jesus in your life. God bless you and God bless you. God bless you, ma'am, in the front row here. God bless you, sir. Anybody else? Raise your hand up high where I can see it, please. Let me pray for you today. In the very back there, God bless you. Young lady back there. Another lady in the back row over here. God bless you. Anybody else? Raise your hand up. Let me pray for you. Anybody else? You want this relationship with God? Let me add this. Maybe you've fallen away from the Lord. There was a time when you knew Him and you walked with Him and you loved Him, but you've forgotten about Him and your life has become a big mess. But the good news is Jesus welcomes you home with open arms today. You can come back to him. That's not why you planned or why you came to church today. You didn't plan on doing it, but this is what you know you want to do. If you need to make a recommitment to Christ, come back to Jesus. Raise up your hand. Let me pray for you. You want to return to the Lord. Raise your hand up. God bless you. Anybody else? Raise your hand now. I'll pray for you. God bless all of you. All right, every one of you that has lip, have lifted your hand, I want you to stand to your feet and I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. Just stand up and I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. Everyone that lifted your hand to give your life to Jesus, even if you did not lift your hand, but you wanna make this commitment or recommitment to Christ, stand to your feet. You heard me right, stand up and I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. Wherever you are, we're gonna pray this prayer out loud. God bless you and you. Anybody else, stand up. Don't be embarrassed, you're among family. Ohana. We're rooting for you. I'll wait one more moment. Anybody else, stand to your feet. God bless you, sir. And I'll lead you in this prayer. Anybody else, stand now. God bless all of you standing. Now pray this prayer out loud after me. Again, you that are standing, pray this prayer out loud after me. Pray these words. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner but I know that you're the Savior who died on the cross for me and rose again from the dead. I turn from my sin now and I choose to follow you, Jesus, from this moment forward. Thank you for calling me and accepting me and forgiving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless each one of you that stood and prayed that prayer. God bless you guys. Amen. Hey, listen. All of you that stood to pray this prayer, we have a Bible we want to give you that looks like the one I'm holding here. This is called the Start Bible. It's pretty easy to see. Red Bible, white arrow. We want you to take this home. It has a New Testament in it and also some notes that I wrote that will encourage. Actually, this is the whole Bible. Excuse me. whole Bible here along with some notes that I wrote that will encourage you in this commitment or recommitment you've made to the Lord. So are we going to send them over? Here's Freddie. Freddie, come on over here. This is Freddie. Say hello to Freddie this morning. Hey, Freddie. So Freddie has the Bible too. So all of you that just prayed that prayer, in fact, why don't we all stand up right now and Pastor Ricky's going to come up. But all of you that prayed that prayer with me, would you just leave your seat and walk over here to where Freddie is and we're going to give you this start Bible. So all of you that prayed with me a moment ago, Leave your seat. Come on right over here. Let Freddie give you this Bible. God bless you guys.